It's great to be back on the road again. We're live tonight from Western Sydney. Welcome to Q&A. Hey there, it's great to be with you from the Joan Sutherland Performing Arts Centre in Penrith. We'll get to some breaking news tonight with questions over whether Gladys Berejiklian broke her own COVID guidelines. Answering your questions, artist and lawyer Amani Hayder is here. New South Wales Minister for Jobs, Investment and Western Sydney, Stuart Ayres. Fairfield City Councillor, Di Lee. Deputy Leader of the Federal Opposition, Richard Miles. And Director of Western Sydney Women, Amanda Rose. Please make all of them feel welcome. Uh, now, I need to start with a question to you, Stuart Ayres. It's breaking news tonight. It's being widely reported that Gladys Berejiklian took a COVID test last Tuesday, budget day in New South Wales, didn't go home and isolate. Why? I don't think she had any COVID symptoms. She'd lost a voice. She was pretty upfront about that, but didn't exhibit any other symptoms and took a precautionary COVID test. Results came back in a couple of hours. But the instructions from your own Department of Health are clear, saying that you must self-isolate if you've been tested and are awaiting results. Why does that not apply to the Premier? Oh, I think she's evaluated what's important for her. I think that she's not exhibited any symptoms and she's done the right thing. Here. So we can all do that? Just evaluate for ourselves and, and make a decision? I think if people aren't exhibiting symptoms, yeah. So you, so you can take a COVID test and not go home and isolate? No, if you're not exhibiting symptoms and you're taking a precautionary test, I think what the Premier's done here is right. But, but that's contrary to your own guidelines. I think you'll find the guidelines say if you're exhibiting symptoms. No, actually, New South Wales Department of Health Guidelines, I've been there tonight, I've got it printed yep. out here, says you must self-isolate if you have been tested for COVID-19 and are awaiting results. So it could not be clearer. Yeah, I think the key point here is that she's gone and taken a precautionary test, but she's not exhibiting any symptoms. She fronts the meter every single day. She's lost a voice, probably anticipated that she might get a question. She's gone and done that. I don't think she's put anyone at risk here. Uh, Amanda Rose? Oh, well... To be honest, it was during budget time, right? And it is our premier. And I think we're making a bit of a mountain out of a molehill in this particular instance because, to be honest, I want her to get on with the job and get on with the budget and, you know, because doing what I do and especially with women, we need uh, as much support. Uh, we need the budget to be on point. We need um, our Premier to be working 24-7, although I, I know do, it Do we need her to obey the COVID guidelines, though? Yes, but just like Stuart said, and look, I'm not one to actually agree with politicians much, and I don't particularly like people that disregard guidelines. I'm quite um, aggressive with that. But then I'm also not um, self-righteous in the sense of saying, in this particular instance, you have to follow the rules down the line, so forth. There are some times we have to say, well, the circumstances were. And I think based on what we've heard, that the fact that she didn't show any symptoms and so forth, then yes, I don't think it's a massive issue. Although, yes, to the, to the everyday person, they're thinking, well, hang on a minute, I have to go and isolate, why can't you? So I understand that, but then we also need to say, well, this is the Premier and we need to make sure she gets on with the job. So, Richard Miles, a different set of rules apply to our leaders? Well, they shouldn't. Um, I mean, I don't want to have a go at Gladys Berejiklian and I don't know her side of the story. I'm not exactly sure what we mean by a precautionary test, um, but obviously these protocols matter um, and it's really important that the same rule that applies to everyone out there applies to our leaders and I don't think anyone can live through what we have in Victoria and be under any illusion as to what's at stake here. Uh, I mean, this disease can get out so easily. And so it's really important that there is a consistent set of protocols which just applies to everyone within the community. There was something which led her to have that test and, and the, the, the protocols are what they are. I mean, just to clarify, because there'll be people at home tonight mm. that are confused about what you should do if you've had a test. Mm. Are you saying that if you haven't shown any symptoms but you have had a test, you can stay at work? No, I'm saying that if you haven't exhibited any symptoms and you go and get a test... Um, you, you don't have to isolate if you've not exhibited symptoms. So that, that's a, that seems to be a change to the guidelines. No, I think really what we're talking about here is the actions the Premier took. 
She's gone and taken a precautionary test. She's had the results yeah. back in a couple of hours. Um, she's not exhibited any symptoms. I, I don't think she's done anything wrong so, here. So, Hamish, I think we've got to understand what, what, what was the circumstance of the test. Um, I, I quarantined out of Victoria back in September and part of the protocol of going into the ACT was that we took a test on day 12 of our quarantine. I didn't have symptoms, but it was part of the measure by which I was able to quarantine. That's one thing. But if you've gone and had a test because you something's happening, you, you feel you've lost your voice, um, there is some symptom, then I'm not sure there's any category of precautionary test. I mean, you've gone to get a test because of some way you're feeling. Um, and in that circumstance, I think the protocols are completely clear. Dai Lee? Yeah, I've just been listening and just weighing up because I know, knowing Gladys, having worked with her, she's a very meticulous and very careful person. Um, so... Uh, you know, basically, if, she, you know, she probably was talking so much, meeting, having so many meetings, probably lost her voice, uh, and perhaps making a personal judgment saying that I'm actually not sick um, and taking that, well, precautionary to do that test because just to actually maybe alleviate uh, the concerns of her colleagues but don't feel or don't have any symptoms of being sick, uh, perhaps. But it's... Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm. I'm not in her shoes. I don't know the circumstances. Um, I think the exciting thing here is that the. the um, it's going to be updated now, right? The, the the guidelines that if you don't show any symptoms, you don't have to self isolate. Because that's what I'm getting from Stuart. Yeah, I think if you don't exhibit symptoms, you don't have to get a test. There you go. <laughs> yeah, but we're not updating guidelines on Q and A. No, no. I mean, no. Our, our guidelines are done by. Our by medical, a text? Our, well, no, our medical advisors, and they come up with the protocols. It's not a, we don't have the power to change them right here. But, but the, the minister, who's one of Gladys Berger Uclean's closest allies, seem to be saying that there are some different rules here. No, I'm saying if you don't exhibit symptoms, you don't need to get tested. I think Gladys is allowed to go and have a test. I don't think she's put anyone at risk here. I completely agree with Di. She's meticulous in the way that she approaches her work. The concept that Gladys would make a decision to put anyone that she's near, a colleague, uh, a friend um, at risk, I, I just completely reject that principle. OK. Well, it is wonderful to be here in great, Greater Western Sydney tonight. This region is, in fact, Australia's third biggest economy, just behind Sydney and Melbourne. Sydney's heart is moving its beat from east to west. We're travelling to Penrith, 50 kilometres from the coast. Welcome to Greater Western Sydney, or GWS as it's become known. It's one of the largest growing urban populations in Australia. The numbers are already well clear of 2 million. And by the year 2036, some 3 million people will be calling GWS home. GWS is nearly 9,000 square kilometres, running from Canterbury Bankstown up to the Hunter Valley, out to the Blue Mountains and down to the Wollongong border. As the population swells, cities like Perth and Parramatta are becoming metropolitan hubs. Government departments, industry and the arts are moving their headquarters west and there's a new airport on the way. Now, these might look like your standard urban Australian streets, but the numbers around here tell a remarkable story of dynamism and diversity. Some 35% of the people living here were born overseas. They've come to Australia from something like 170 different countries. And today, more than 100 languages are spoken around here. In Penrith itself, First Nations people make up 5% of the population. What's good about living in the western suburbs of Sydney? The community and the love. Definitely more accepting. Diversity and house prices. Still like a bit of a country area that people get on well. The west is the best place to be. But this vast region remains littered with pockets of joblessness and disadvantage. It'll be evolving areas like this that the nation is going to rely on as it struggles to regain its economic footing. So the question tonight, have authorities prepared these exposed communities to survive and thrive as they too face the impact of this global pandemic? Well, our next question tonight comes from Aaron Ponson, who's in our studio audience. Aaron. Thank you. I was born and grew up in Western Sydney and it's changed a great deal, especially in regards to immigrants. 
I feel we have an inundation of immigrants and there are too many from too many different countries. Why can't we just lower the immigration levels? This is our country. We have a right to lower immigration levels. Other countries, such as the USA, have a much lower rate. And shouldn't we stop labelling people opposed to immigration as racist? Amani. I think one of the things that came through the package just then and one of the things that I really appreciate about, appreciate about Western Sydney is the diversity that we have, which is as a result of our humanitarian impact in part, um, intake in part. So, for example, the Fairfield area has one of Australia's largest humanitarian refugee intakes and that adds to um, the richness of the area. And even though there are particular barriers and significant issues that we can um, address in order to support newly settled refugees, um, I think we need to actually embrace the sense of community that's, happen that's happening as this area evolves and um, really lean into that and find a way to empower those communities and um, build on what's already happening. I'm proud to be from Western Sydney. I'm proud to be from a very diverse community. I can see really exciting things happening in my area, in the arts, um, in, in terms of the types of community services that are springing up everywhere to make sure that people are well supported. But there's a really strong and clear Western Sydney identity, isn't there? I think there is, but it's not just one thing. I mean, we've heard as well, like, we're on Aboriginal land. It's Darug country here where we are now. So that, that should first and foremost be recognised. And then we can talk about the um, different people who have settled here over time and the way that that's changed the face of the community. I think it's really um, uh, something that that is has been positive in the sense that it's created a very unique society that there is um, not much like it out there in the world um, in terms of the uh, diversity that we have here. I think um, I'm part of Sweatshop Western Sydney. We're producing a lot of literature by young people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and empowering, th empowering them through literacy and providing opportunities for publication um, and art artistic projects to um, be, um, for them to participate in art artistic projects. I think um, Dai Lee and I were at an art exhibition recently at the Fairfield Community Museum and Gallery where um, a collection of artifact, um, items that people had brought with them from overseas was on display and that in itself was a way of um, highlighting the different stories that exist in Western Sydney and the ways that they've actually had a really um, important, they play a really important and positive role in the shaping of our identity. Dai, how do you respond to the um, Can I say, actually, immigration actually has stopped in the last seven months because of COVID. Um, but I can actually, I, I acknowledge your, probably your fear in terms of the differences of community groups that have settled in Australia over the last few decades. I came here as a refugee from Vietnam, couldn't speak English, here I am today, sitting in this room. So I think I understand for people like yourself, um, having such a uh, diverse group of people settling in the community, I think with government not having, not explaining uh, in terms of bringing communities together is where the tension is. I think the lack of leadership in actually providing stories and sharing stories of what we can actually bring and what we can contribute to this community so that we can actually, you can understand our story and our journey. Uh, so I think um, we need more of that kind of stories to be shared for people like yourself so they can actually understand those differences. We're not here, we're not, we, for me, I came here because I want to make Australia my own home. You know, it's my second homeland after Vietnam. So I'm, a, I'm an Australian as much as you. Sure, I wasn't born here, but I think, I think what your question lead to is the lack of leadership in our political arena to actually provide a bridge between me and you so that you can understand me and I can understand you. So mm. I think that what Armani said, what we're trying to do in our community, like for me, I live and breathe southwestern Sydney. Um, I think there's so much richness of diversity of stories and, and cultures there that we can actually impart to the wider Australian community. And I hope that we can do that. And I hope that down the track, in the next time when we come on a Q&A, you'll be sitting there and you'll be celebrating the diversity that we have brought to this country. I just, just want to broaden this out. Do you see parallels with the, your community, Richard? You're from Victoria, represented an electorate outside of Melbourne, uh, a lot of growth, uh, but a lot of changing demographics. 
Well, certainly when I was watching your package, there's a lot in that which reminds me uh, of Geelong, where, where I'm from. It's a, a similar distance from the centre of Melbourne as what uh, we are here from uh, the centre of Sydney. Um, certainly Western Sydney is much more diverse in terms of uh, the, the, the people who are here than, than what we would see in Geelong. And, and, Do you um, think and it's a failure of leadership, though, as described by Di, uh, politicians bridging the divisions? Uh, I do, actually. I, th I think that's a really important contribution that, that, that Di has made. And, and look, I, I, I hear the question of Aaron. Certainly, it should be completely legitimate to talk about the question of immigration. But one of the points I'd make is that with COVID-19 and, and the fact that we've seen a, a stop with, with well, a stalling, I guess is the way to put it, with immigration, I think that's going to have a huge impact on our economy. Mm. Um, and it's really put into sharp relief how important immigration is to our economy. And when you... So, so would, would Labor in government return us to the pre-COVID immigration levels? Well, I, th I think immigration has been a fundamental part of the Australian story, really, since... Uh, European no one's settlement. arguing that. That's a question about well, whether well, you've returned I, I think, to the pre-COVID levels. I, I think we do need to see immigration get back to something around that level uh, because it's what drives economic growth, but it's been central to Australia's story since European settlement. And, and, and immigration you, you has been very yeah. central to our, our economic growth and to who we are as a people. Yeah, migration is going to be absolutely crucial in the way our nation recovers from COVID. And the, the group of Australians that need to be most focused on this are actually older Australians. Because what migrants do is they make our community younger. They actually bring more workers mm. in. And so at a time when our population is ageing, we're actually going to need more younger people to be able to create the jobs, create the economic prosperity to actually sustain a lot of older Australians into retirement. And we're going to be put under that pressure more so now, given we've had this year with no migration. It's going to be really critical that we get those numbers back. So That's exactly it was right. Aaron, correct? May I ask why you feel that way? Well, Bob Carr very famously said that he wanted to halve immigration for the sake of the economy. Okay. And, of course, he's not racist. He's married to an Asian woman. So, for him, it's about the economy. It's about infrastructure. I mean, there's a lot of massive apartments being built. And I feel that the quality of life is going down. And, you know, the idea of having a house and a backyard is sort of lost. Yep. We're becoming a, a city of apartments and okay. the prices are just so too much. Let, yeah. let me let Amanda respond. Yeah, so no, I, I, I respect that. And I think understanding where people come from is crucial in communicating the story that you all just talked about. So I understand your fear that you think there won't be enough houses, there won't be enough jobs in the economy. But I think the, uh, what Di was saying, very much so, that we need to communicate the opportunities and what there is available. I actually think there's been a disconnect. You know, I'm dealing with massive different cultures all the time yeah. and bringing them together under one umbrella, for example, for me is with women and they're communicating and sharing stories makes a big difference. So I do invite you to actually um, maybe sit with your local MP, come and visit myself, Di, have a discussion so we can show you that it's actually good for the country and it's not as bad as you think. I, I want to bring Dewey Nguyen in on, on this conversation because you've got a question along those lines. Uh, which question? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, question you've submitted. Do you want to uh, put that to the panel? Uh, the question I submitted, or the question uh, I was about to barge in into doing. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you want to ask? Sell it. Uh, all right. So um, uh, I understand uh, that uh, uh, the uh, sh uh, the shadow minister for defence would be. Uh, uh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, I can't Richard recall. Miles you. is his name. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, um, so uh, has uh, okay. With regards to the immigration issue, has anyone considered that um, perhaps that refugees are only coming here be, uh, as a result of constant Australian uh, following the coattails of uh, American intervention overseas in Afghanistan? Okay, uh, I think I haven't said this once this year, but let's take that as a comment and move on. Our next question tonight. Uh, in fact, remember you can stream us on iView and join the conversation on all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please keep it. Respectful if you can. Our next question comes from Erin Foster. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask, over my working life, I've actually had job offers rescinded uh, when my employees found out that I'll be commuting from Western Sydney. 
Uh, given Astra, uh, Sydney's status as a commuter, commuter city, I just wanted to ask um, how the government plans to address the, the troubling transport, public transport woes uh, to the area. I'm going to put that to Amanda Rose first. I'm, I'm so sorry that's happened to you. I can't say what I really want to say on live TV. Tell me, what uh, is I'm, it that you really want to uh, say? That's bullshit, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that happens a lot. So the stigma, that's actually a stigma related, not just even, oh, I'm sorry you have to travel so far. That's rubbish because if someone wants a job, they will travel. I've travelled an hour and a half for a job because it's just, it is what it is mm. and until things change, you have to do that. But to have a job rescinded because of where you're from and because you're from Western Sydney, that is discrimination and that is the stigma that comes with Western Sydney. So I am pro moving government departments and large companies to Penrith CBD, you know, even to the Hawkesbury, to Parramatta, to all of that. So we Fairfield. Don't, <laughs> Fairfield, so we don't have to travel as far. And I think we need to do more of that. I think there needs to be a lot more lobbying for that to happen. What, what is the perception that exists on oh. the other side of the city of people in Western Sydney? Oh, if you're from Western Sydney, honey, you're not smart. You know, you're not ambitious. You know, you, you don't really want to make it in life. I mean, I'm sick to death of hearing, oh, he's a Blacktown boy, you know, gone good, or haven't you done well for yourself, sweetheart? Right? I even did a TEDx talk on the stigma of Western Sydney. It was that bad. And it happens and we don't talk about it because we're the shame of it, you know? But people don't even put where they're from on their CVs because they get that, oh... Are you sure? Or well, where is that? And then it's kind of, I would put you at the bottom of the pile. And it's classism, right? People assume that people from Western Sydney are a different type of breed. I mean, you know what? Come to Western Sydney. Mm. Have a look. We are smart. We're ambitious. We just never had uh, access to the opportunities that the rest of the city have, and now we do. Now, thanks to myself and these lovely women here on the panel, we're doing everything we can to make sure uh, that women in particular are having access to better education, safety, all of that. I think, I think with the um, COVID world that we're living in, I think I've, I'm find it surprising that they would do that because we can now work uh, from home. Uh, I think that's the great thing about um, what has COVID-19 has presented for women to work from home um, and you can actually don't have to go into the office anymore. So I think that's surprising and I think those that kind of organisations should really reflect on its work Flexible, uh, flexible work policies because, you know, we're in it's 2020. An, it's an attitude thing. It's not about their flexibility. But this was ultimately, Stuart, as a question about transport. What are you doing to make it easier for mm. people yeah, uh, to, to get those jobs <laughs> and to remove yeah. the excuses that might exist in the minds of some? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is bring jobs closer to where people live. That's mm. why we've got investments in roads and rail across Western Sydney. It's one of the reasons why we're developing the Aerotropolis areas around the airport. It's why we've got more investment into tra train transport between places like Penrith, Blacktown, Parramatta. Uh, the, Fairfield. This is fair, Fairfield. Half Fairfield. Um, we have the heart. You, you don't yeah. win a prize for saying no. Fairfield, Bob <laughs> the <laughs> If there was a prize for saying Fairfield, I would definitely win. <laughs> um, but, uh, and even including... Um, and additional road infrastructure, new tunnels that allow people to be able to move around the city more effectively. Mm. I think really what's happening now is Western Sydney is taking ownership of its own outcomes. It's not waiting for someone on the east of the city to give them an answer or give them a job. They're actually going out and doing that themselves. And I think the infrastructure that's being delivered and has been delivered particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, has really changed those opportunities that exist right around Western Sydney. There just seem to be big gaps. There's a lot of outcry in the budget last week. You seem to neglect any extension of the Parramatta light rail. Mm. That was widely foreshadowed. I mean, is this more about sort of marketing and selling a message than actually delivering for people like this? No, the largest road project in Australia's history links Western Sydney with Eastern Sydney. The largest rail transport project in Australia's history will link East and West so together. So we just forgot about the light rail extension? No, I think uh, we're, we're putting infrastructure where it's needed most. Um, we've done so that. So it's not needed? Is that what you're saying? I, I think that that section of, of Parramatta linking to Olympic Park is going to be incredibly well serviced by a, the biggest metro rail the nation's ever built. Let's uh, see how that works and then decide whether we need to keep adding to it. Uh, Amani, do you think they're delivering on your transport needs? <laughs> Transport to Western Sydney has been pretty bad for as long as I've worked and lived there. Um, I've lived in other places around Sydney and haven't had the same problem. You're adding about, some, you know, one to two, sometimes a little bit more hours of mm. travel to your day each day. 
you lose time with your family, you get home when it's dark, it's, you miss out on opportunities like even basic things, going to the gym, um, sharing dinner yeah. with your kids if they have to go to bed early. And I think that uh, sometimes people um, lose focus on how people's everyday lives are affected by bad infrastructure, bad planning, um, things like that. So I think, I think you definitely have a point. I'm so sorry that's happened to you. And I think there definitely needs to be more done in terms of um, supporting the population that lives in Western Sydney and also making sure that th that planning is well thought out, considered and allows um, people to also engage in their local community in a way that's meaningful. Mm. All right. Well, one question, our next question, in fact, goes to something that we've all been talking a lot about this week, allegations of Australians committing war crimes. It comes from mm. Peter Willis. G'day, Hamish in the panel. Uh, I've been a soldier for 35 years, so I have a reasonable understanding of Australian military history. Considering the well-reported and, in some cases, well-documented um, uh, incidences of uh, the killing of POWs and innocent, and innocent civilians from the Boer War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and murder was just as immoral in 1943 as it is now. Why, as a society, are we so shocked now to, uh, with these current allegations against our special forces? Richard Miles. Well, I'm glad we're shocked, to be honest. Um, and when I speak to the, the leadership of our Defence Force, they're shocked. Um, I mean, the allegations that we saw uh, reported last week in the Brereton Report are, are truly appalling. I mean, there's no other way of describing it. Um, and I think the idea that it happened uh, with people wearing our uniform um, is a matter which should shock us all. Um, but if there is a positive in this, it's that we, um, as a country, you know, and, and indeed the Defence Force itself, have, have brought this to the public light. I mean, nothing has been hidden here. It uh, hasn't been swept under the carpet. And there's a lot of serious process to go forward. But, you know, this is not what the Defence Force should be about. Um, it is to the Defence Force's credit that it has been brought forward. It is really important that our focus right now um, is on the victims of this. And one of the recommendations in the report is that there be a process for developing recompense for them, and that's, it's very important that that um, is fulfilled. Um, but I don't think we should, uh, at any level, lessen the significance of what we saw last week, and certainly the Defence Force itself is not. Imani? Um, first of all, I want to really express my condolences to the victims of those crimes and my, the members of the Afghan community um, that I know and work with and um, my colleagues, who um, some of whom are here today. Um, secondly, I want to say that a lot of people that um, grew up in my community are not shocked. Um, we've grown up with the reality of war. We've had family members affected by it. I know the Afghan women that I've spoken to in the last few days are not shocked either. Um, my friend Diana Al Sayed, who is a colleague from uh, the Australian Afghan Lawyers Association, um, said that we need to move past this expression of shock and concern and really look towards what victims need, how we can repair the situation. And rather than trying to feel better about it in the sense that, oh, maybe there's a positive, there isn't. Um, atrocities like this take place regularly and often. In war, about 70% of uh, modern warfare um, fatalities are civilians. The majority of those would be women and children. Um, we shouldn't be shocked. We should actually be thinking about how we transform our culture both um, within our own nation and internationally so things like this don't happen. Mm. Um, another thing that my friends from the Afghan community pointed to was the fact that after so many years of Muslims and Afghans and refugees being demonised in the media, um, of course when someone is holding a weapon and they see someone who they no longer think of as, as a human being, um, that person is then at that extra risk of violence. Um, do, do you think that played a part in this? I don't know. I'm not in the minds of the people who are involved, but it definitely plays a role in um, these sorts of atrocities. 
Um, I was lucky enough as a lawyer to be trained in the investigation of war crimes. There's a huge process that goes into this sort of thing. It's very difficult for the victims of these crimes to come forward because mm. of fear of persecution and the trauma that the process can entail. And we only start, this is like scratching the surface. You don't know how many people from um, these sorts of war zones don't ever get found. They go missing after surrendering. There are people who um, never live to tell their story. There are people who are too afraid to talk about it because they've been tortured by um, soldiers or members of the government and things like that. And then it takes a long time to get any kind of accountability because often the people who are responsible hold a lot of power. Um, mm. I have... I, I want to bring Stuart Ayres yeah. in. You, I know you come from a military family. Did all of this shock you? I think what this really demonstrates is there's a set of values that I think Australians hold incredibly dear um, and the, the presentation of those values is represented through the Australian Defence Force and what this is is a betrayal of those values uh, and we, we need to acknowledge that that betrayal has taken place and there needs to be a process that allows us to recognise the people who have done the wrong thing and hold them to account. And a group of people well, that I... What are those values that have been breached then? Um, well, the rule of law, um, mm. the recognition of humanity, the reason why members of the Australian Defence Force go and defend Australia's national values, why they go into nations that are under attack by people who don't have the same values as us. They put that uniform on, put themselves in harm's way, but they also make an obligation that they'll do that in a particular way that represents what Australians believe in mm. and what has happened in Afghanistan and what we are all going to go through in the most uncomfortable of ways is, is a breach of those values. What do you think exactly Australia right. achieved by going to war in Afghanistan? I, I think the intention, the clear intention, was to remove um, the Taliban from being able to create a, a government that was going to put other nations and other people at risk around the world. Um, and we've... We've deployed those servicemen and women um, and put them in harm's way so they can protect Australians, so they can protect people from, mm. from other countries who want an opportunity to live in a free and democratic society. Um, but with that comes obligations. I, yeah, I think what Stuart said, I think is really well said, actually, the way Stuart has put it. Um, we were right to be in Afghanistan. Uh, and I actually think it would be a tragedy if the way in which we see our engagement in Afghanistan is solely through the prism of these allegations. And in that sense, I, I feel very much for the thousands of Australians who gave distinguished service in Afghanistan. Uh, I but, think but the with allegations... Respect, the, the, just, the, the, no, with I mean, respect, the objective was to remove the Taliban from power, to prevent Afghanistan from being used as a base for international terrorist organisations and to install democracy. Now, you could maybe argue that there's some form of democracy, but the Taliban is now negotiating to return to some form of power and ISIS and Al-Qaeda are both active there. So what did we achieve? Well, uh, we, we did seek to remove, uh, to stop Afghanistan being used as a base for international terrorism. There's no sense in which it's being used now in the way that it was pre-September 11. And we, we should remember, Australians died on September 11. There were... But you acknowledge that ISIS is there and active? Sure, but, but it's not the same as what was going on uh, before September 11. And no one would make the argument now that Afghanistan is in the same position in terms of being a base for international terrorism as it was then. Um, I mean, the organisation which perpetrated the Bali bombing used Afghanistan as a training camp. But then beyond that, Hamish, uh, you know, Australia, and it goes to one of the values that you said, I, I, I think Australia, we would all want to be one of that group of countries or in that group of countries which is willing to help when another country puts its hand up and asks for assistance. And that's exactly what Afghanistan has done. And so Australian involvement there has been seeking to um, empower Afghanistan to a point where it has more effective government governance. With respect, there I, don't is think a... I don't think Afghanistan invited uh, the conflict. I mean, America no, no, invited us to co cooperate with it. No, no, at the outset. Uh, but where we're at now is that we are there very much at the invitation of the Afghan government uh, seeking to empower this government uh, to create a greater sense of governance within the country. And there's clearly a long way to go. No one's saying there isn't. But what Australians are doing there um, is, is, is providing help and assistance. And that goes to the sort of values that we're about, I think, as a nation and what the ADF's about. Do you which think is the Afghan why... people see it that way now? Oh, well, well the, as I say, we, we are there trying to support Afghanistan and very much there at their invitation. Um, but, but it is why these 
allegations are so appalling because, as Stuart said, it flies in the face of all the values which underpin uh, the really important engagement that we've had there and the, and the distinguished service that so many thousands of Australians have gone through and I, and I feel for them in this moment. Yeah. Hamish, I think, I think there's a really important point here. We've, as a nation, we've got to go through this very uncomfortable exercise so that we can recognise all of the members of the Australian Defence Force who do the right thing. You, you've got to go through this process to be able to identify those people who did the wrong thing and hold them accountable so that all of the members of the Australian Defence Force who have been doing the right thing year after year, month after month, week after week, aren't tarnished with this process. Yes, but then it's also a cultural thing. So if, if this type of activity is happening, like in an organisation, and they feel comfortable to do this type of activity, that means that group that, I don't know what they call them in the, in the Defence Force. The elite, the elite. You know, uh, why was there a culture created where they felt this was okay, mm -hmm. that they thought this type of behaviour was okay? So I think we can say sorry, we can do all these things and say we're shocked, but what are we doing moving forward to make sure that that group that misbehaved, where did they come from, who was their leader, and why was there a culture created where they thought this behaviour was okay? Uh, uh, Lala Fidali, I think you have a question, but I'm just interested to hear your reaction to this conversation. Yes, so as an um, Australian Afghan who was born in Afghanistan, um, I came here when I was five as a refugee. We flew away from Afghanistan, essentially escaped due to the war, um, civil war that was occurring. Um, to hear things such as, in essence, a glorification of our soldiers, Australian soldiers going to Afghanistan, the reality is if you hear or are in touch with family members or listen to daily Af news in Afghanistan to which we have access to those channels, the situation has definitely not improved. The situation in Afghanistan is so much more worse at the moment. Every second day there are terrorist bombings. I think it doesn't affect the Australian population. It's not on global TV, so that's why you don't hear about it. But to say that, to be honest, in any way, Australian soldiers have assisted Afghanistan or the situation there, I think we're actually lying to ourselves. I think the reality is that there's been no assistance. The situation in Afghanistan is far worse for the people living there. And the reality is America and the Taliban are in negotiations at the moment. So to go there, to remove the Taliban, to then so many years later be back in negotiations, what has any of it really achieved? Richard Miles? No one, and I'm certainly not suggesting that, that, that Afghanistan um, is in a wonderful position. That's not the point I'm making. But we do need to consider what the situation in Afghanistan was before um, this international mission started, when girls weren't able to go to school. I mean, people who were Hindus had to wear a particular badge on them to identify their religion. I mean, the, the, the situation that was, was going on in Afghanistan before then was absolutely appalling. And, and, and in that sense, things are no longer like that. Um, now, no, Lala, I'm not here I, saying... I, I, I need to hear let Lala respond. I'd like to just say we have to look back towards the history of what gave rise to the Taliban. Who were the people that actually funded the Taliban and assisted them to fight the Russians during the invasion? And that came through the West. So, in essence, you gave rise to the Taliban to then allow them or to then say you want to fight a war against them. The reality is for people that come from countries like that, we have a different concept and understanding of what happens there. There's a level of, I think, deeper understanding just through the way that we've been raised and obviously the experiences we've had. So, yes, I completely agree with you, the Taliban, no one supports them, no one wants in Afghanistan to be under their rule, but really, to us, is it any better? Because we've kind of been given the Taliban and then we've been given other people who are now forcing other atrocities, it really, I don't know, can you really make a big distinction? Well, well, uh, the, well the only point I then, then, then make is that um, if the country at this moment in time is seeking assistance from the global community because of all the issues that you raised, are we going to be one of that group, in that group of country which says we'll help? Now, I think Australia should. Um, and I think we proudly should be one of those countries which is willing to provide assistance when a country has gone through everything that you just described, seeks it. And that's the situation that we've got at the moment. Yeah, it's really complex. It's and yeah, and, uh, but, but should we be there? I, I, I think we should, and it needs to be appropriate. Well, I know you calibrated. need this young lady on your policy advising team, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take our next question. It comes from Kate Rafton. 
Thanks. Um, my question specifically to the women advocates on the panel. Um, I'm a lawyer here in Western Sydney and I mainly practice in the area of family law. We have seen an increase in cases coming before the court during the pandemic and in particular those involving domestic violence. Um, how do you see the community and the government supporting these groups of people and what resources are required? Amani. Thank you for that question. I've been involved in the um, domestic violence advocacy space in Western Sydney primarily, but also on a state level. Um, since about 2017, I lost my mum, Salwa Haidar, to domestic violence in 2015. My dad was subsequently found guilty of her murder and is serving time in prison now. Um, through that experience, I sort of witnessed a lot of different facets of the mm. systems that we have to work with, a lot of the ways that victims um, are marginalised by the system and a lot of the systemic failures that actually leave women in harm's way. Um, I now sit on the board of Bankstown Women's Health Centre, working primarily with um, women in the Canterbury-Bankstown area so that um, they can access health supports, counselling and things like that. And we hear the exact same thing and COVID has exacerbated the situation. So we've had an increase of about 20 to 30% in women reporting domestic violence to the service. Um, we've had uh, very little increase in support or funding over the years. In fact, the core funding for the women's health services has stayed the same for 45 years. Um, programs are often funded on a one to three year basis. And so you start doing something fantastic with your community and you're, you're not even able to measure really the impact of it in such a short term um, uh, funding um, sort of turnover. I think all of these issues, um, a lot of the advocates and frontline workers in the domestic violence space have expressed time and time again frustration about, about these things and the fact that um, whilst there have been pockets of change here and there, on a systemic level, a lot of things have stayed the same. And I know that the first speech I gave um, as an advocate in 2017, I could probably copy word for word and read out and still be true right now in terms mm. of the policy issues that, I uh, that were identified then. Can I just ask you, your... your Family tragedy shapes everything that you do, I think, today. How do you, how does it shape the way you think about this moment in time when so many people have been in lockdown, so many people have been stuck in circumstances that perhaps they might normally not have been? Um, it definitely shapes everything I do. I think uh, my main um, feeling is concern towards the number of women that we know are mm. um, in abusive relationships and the fact that we know that it's an underreported crime, um, the fact that services face so many different barriers and limitations in terms of what they can do, um, the slow changes that take place um, on a legislative level. I think for me the biggest concern is that um, the greater public sometimes still doesn't understand the, the drivers of domestic violence. Mm. They want to individualise the crime, they want to blame the victims, they want to uh, derail the conversation in all sorts of directions so that they don't actually have to confront the issue of male violence. So for me the biggest concern is getting those messages across, um, making sure that we honour and respect the stories of victims. There will be a vigil at Hyde Park on Wednesday for the um, International Day for the Elimination of violence against women. Um, I'll be speaking there. Uh, you can tune in on your phone online and watch um, and hear their names. We've lost 45 women, I think, the last time I checked the count, to violence this year in mm -hmm. Australia. Amanda? Wow, that is a very good question. Um, so there is so much going on with domestic violence and I'd say the number one issue is they've got nowhere to go. So, you know, you, it's hard enough for them to even access the services that are available because they might get caught doing so. You know, in COVID, I ran, uh, Western Sydney Women ran online, um, you know, toxic relationships, financial literacy type programs, and some women had to quickly turn it off because their partner walked into the room, you know, or there was yelling and they sent a message later, I'm sorry, I can't do it. So we can't even access them. So when they realise this is all too much, I have to run, I have to pack one bag, grab my kids and leave, they've got nowhere to go. If it wasn't for women's uh, community shelters and um, communities getting together and funding and advocating government to get uh, as much money as they can, uh, they would, literally, we're so underfunded when it comes to shelters. We need to have an absolute overhaul uh, and a massive investment with shelters because there's a lot of transitional help out there. So to get them into the workforce and to get them financially literate and things like that's all great, 
but they can't leave the house. Like they can't break free from that relationship. And I don't think people understand or take them seriously. Plus you've got the shame that comes with that. So we need to, and I've noticed probably in the last six months due to COVID, the women have been rising up and different organisations working together, but we need to advocate, if anything, one of the largest funded things to come out of the next state or federal budget is shelters. Okay. Uh, well, Oh. Let's take our next question. It comes from Mick Scarcella. I'm a proud descendant and salt water man from the Gubbio Nation of South East Queensland. However, I have proudly lived most of my life in Western Sydney. My question is, how much money which was squandered by governments on the Lavington Triangle land for the new airport, which could have been better injected to a local manufacturing industry in Western Sydney, which has shown over many generations what this region was built on? Dai Lee. Do it. <laughs> What are you doing to land out there? <laughs> we'll bring in the politicians, but do you think this was money well spent on the Leppington Triangle, both spending at state and federal government level? Look, I think in terms of um, government spending, I think a lot of times federal and state often would um, sp spend money where they need to get the votes. That's from my perspective. Um, you know, but, but in this instance, the federal government bought... $3 million yes, worth I, of land for, for something like $30 million they worth. They were badly advised, very bad advices, I reckon. Um, either that or the, the, the federal government, the, you know, our, our ministers did not fully um, read the papers, Ugh. understand the contract, um, did, understand... They, did they have a responsibility to oh, understand they should. and know? But, you know, I sometimes I wonder if um, people in those senior positions... They've got have so much soul. on and they, um, you know, they delegate it to um, somebody else to look into that and then they sign the paperwork. So uh, a lot of the times um, they don't take responsibility for the details of any kind of contracts or projects because all they want is that that project delivered, you go, get a department, get the staff to work on it and get it, make sure it happens without actually understanding the details of it. Stuart Ayres, was this money well spent by the federal government? I know you're state government, <laughs> but the federal government spending has been well documented, publicised, investigated by the Auditor General. There's no doubt that figure looks extraordinarily <laughs> large for that parcel of land. So I think it's important that there's a proper investigation into how that's undertaken. Can um, we get the money back? Uh, well, maybe you do. I don't. Because I, don't I just know think, you know, I just talked about um, shelters, and we could do with twenty-five million dollars yeah. for and shelters. No doubt, no doubt. Um, that's that's why that's why when you're investing taxpayers' dollars, you've got to do so in a prudent way. The one thing I I would say though, um, and we've had questions about transport and infrastructure, you've you've got to acquire property to to build infrastructure, to build airports, to build rail lines, to build roads. Um, and that's not always an easy process. One of the things that we try to avoid doing is um, doing a compulsory acquisition. So you'll enter into an agreement to get an agreement with a landowner so that you can make that deal happen. Um, because ultimately you want the road or you want the rail line. But there's an obligation here to make sure that you do your homework. And in this particular instance, it does look it just looks like a really large figure. Well, the price paid per hectare was 22 times higher than the price paid by the New South Wales government mm. for its parcel of land in Lambert. I'm glad we bought our parcel of land <laughs> um, and not the other one. Um, yeah, uh, look, Hamish, I, I genuinely don't know the circumstances and I think that's why we do have appropriate investigations. The other thing I would say here is it's really important to recognise a lot of times people talk about what the value of general here in New South Wales valued land at. Um, that's just the value of land unimproved. So if you've got to buy a person's home or you've got to buy their, you know, sheds and outbuildings, all of those things, they go on top of that value. So the figure often is larger than what most people expect. So I think you're talking about the Parramatta land deal that's provo provoked quite a bit of mm. discussion. Your government paid three times as much as the value of general's estimate for a parcel of mm. land near Parramatta that was highly contaminated. Are you saying that was a good deal for the taxpayer? Well, I, Minister Constance has referred that to make sure it's investigated yeah. properly, but you talk about the value of general. If you're buying a home here in Penrith today in South Penrith or Glenmore Park, one of those locations, the value of general's land of your home is just the value of the land before your house is on it, before any other value is on it. Now, when you go to a person 
because their house happens to live in the corridor where a road is. The, the value that you're going to have to pay for that land is going to be much, much higher than what the value of general is. So I don't think you can just multiply the value of general by three and say that's well, what the, the value well, is. There's some very good real estate agents involved with this at some point, isn't there? <laughs> um, I, think, I think, one, you've got, to let it, you've got to let it go through its investigation. But the cost of acquisition of land is going to, be, is going to always be extraordinary. It's probably one of the most the highest cost parts of any form of infrastructure. Richard yeah. Miles, accept well, look, these arguments? The, 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 the Leaping a triangle, triangle Purchase is a scandal. I mean, there's not really any other way to describe it. And I, I don't think we can put it down to administrative error. Um, and, and to me, there are two things that come out of it. Well, well firstly, the, 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 the government have not properly explained it to this date. But two things from there come out of it. One is that when you're doing big infrastructure like this, there's got to be some transparency. I mean, really, the, the, the public do need to have a sense of confidence about what the processes are here and what the proper values are. Uh, but the second is that, you know, at least in New South Wales, there is an ICAC. You know, that doesn't exist at a federal level. And it's exactly why we need that at a federal level so that the public can have a sense of confidence that when there are arrangements like this, when land is purchased in this way, that there is a watchdog that's going to have a look at it when it stinks. Di, I mean, you were saying ministers have got to be more responsible, look at the documents. I know you, you were a member of the Liberal Party. You've been suspended <laughs> for 10 years yes. uh, by them. Uh, if you were in it, would you do a better job with this sort of thing, do you reckon? Oh, look, you know, I think... You mean in... in, in if you were in government, if you were a minister, would you be, you know, running a fine-tooth comb oh, over look, these definitely. sorts of decisions? I think transparency is very important. I think nowadays with technology, you can actually um, ensure that... In the tech space that I deal with, we, you talk about blockchain technology whereby you can upload documents in there and making sure that it's, it's transparent so people can see that. I think, I think um, the ratepayers, the citizens of New South Wales and of Australia really um, deserve the, the respect that our politicians elected on their mm. rate, you know, rate paying kind of taxes, um, that they do the right thing and they do the job properly. Um, and so, therefore, it, spending that much money, that's taxpayers' money... That's right. Um, and ..to build mm. the infrastructure there. And I think state, federal, even local, we need to ensure that we really are dil dil diligent with those taxpayers' money. OK. The next question is from Denise Hennessy. Oh, hello. Hi, Denise. <laughs> What's your question? Um, besides being dumped in the hottest and most polluted part of the Sydney basin, Western Sydney Airport will have no curfew. That is noise 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year, and with no flight caps. They won't even tell us the flight paths. Add to this the so-called jobs bonanza, which I believe is extremely misleading or even dishonest. My question, why treat those that live in Western Sydney and the Blue Mountains with such contempt not requiring a curfew as those that live in the eastern and northern suburbs. Amanda? Yes. <laughs> that is such a good question. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. These are questions that need to be answered. They really do need to be answered. Why isn't there a curfew? You know, what's the justification for that? Do we get tax breaks? Do we get count, uh, rate breaks as a result of that? What's the compensation for that? And with the jobs bonanza, I... I understand your uh, pessimism uh, when it comes to that because I'm on the hunt to find these jobs myself and I have found them. There are some. Uh, and what it is that we need to look at the infrastructure boom that's happening and it is happening, things are you know, moving, but we need to be prepared for it. So I believe there's going to be a lot of jobs, for example, in trades. So we need to get our young generation signing up to trades. You know, Only 9% of youth has considered doing trades when they leave school. We need to change that because that's where the money will be. So it will be there because someone like myself would be advocating hardcore to make sure that those jobs are there for our kids, for our single mums, for our families, for everyone. But I agree with that curfew. I don't like it. Um, I don't mind them having it if there was a justification or a, a, a transaction here. So what do we get in return for that? Stuart Ayres, what do the people of Western Sydney get back in return for there being no curfew yes, on this well, new airport? First thing, let me say, I've just built my own home um, about five kilometres from the airport. Um, it's where I intend to live the rest of my life. So I'm making this commitment to live in this community with this airport the same way I'm asking every other resident around Western Sydney to do so. The second thing I would say is that 
the airport location is vastly different in Western Sydney compared to the airport in the east when it comes to where the population is. We've, for the last almost 30 years, protected development around the airport site so that when an airport comes, we can take those high noise areas and prevent residential development from taking place. That's not to say that there I hope there be... is going to be an answer here no, about why there's no curfew. Well, it's to say that we've already protected the areas of high noise. So the areas that are the highest noise locations for Sydney Airport, the exact same locations in Sydney won't have residential property in them, and that allows us to operate an airport over 24 hours. Um, and we've also restricted development on a much wider area. Are so you saying no one's going to be impacted? No, I'm not saying no not? one's going to be impacted. We're not less. Get, yeah, there's going to be significant. But they're going to get less. rebates. <laughs> there's going to be. There's always going to be noise that's associated with the city, whether it's airport noise, train noise, road noise, and aircraft noise is one of those things. But we've created a planning regime. Both Liberal and Labor governments over the last 20 years have fiercely protected the flight corridors in and out of those uh, two runways so that people in the future aren't impacted by aircraft noise the same way those who live close to Sydney Airport Do you are. buy this, Amanda? You know I don't buy anything until I see it actually happen, <laughs> right? Because that's how I work. I'm very hopeful uh, and I ask lots of questions which I think need to be um, asked. But, you know, saying that uh, you talk about pathways, and I think um, this lady asked about we don't even know what the flight paths are. Yeah. Right, so mm -hmm. to guarantee that the flight paths aren't going to affect people as much, I think that needs to be um, public information so people can choose where they want to buy their homes as well because a lot of people are buying in Western Sydney. They might choose not to buy in an area because there's a flight path. So... I believe in transparency. I also believe in infrastructure. So I'm pro the airport. I'm pro the jobs that come with that. But I think there's a disconnect between what's happening, communicating with the actual community about what's happening and getting their feedback and taking that on board and changing things as, you, as you're going. Why don't you yeah. publish the flight parts? Yeah. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I don't get an opportunity to do that. The Commonwealth Government yeah. has to publish flight paths. They run the airport. But what is published, Hamish, is the areas of the highest noise because they are in direct alignment with the runways. So we know where the runways are. We know that if you stretch that runway out multiple kilometres, you know where the high noise locations are. And we've restricted development in those sites. In fact, there's an area in Fairfield right now where people are um, quite disappointed that Furious. we're not allowing them to uh, actually uh, subdivide and build more homes because they're at the, right at the last pointy end of that corridor. Don't worry, so Di, they'll pay $33 million There's already, million there's for already it. people that we're starting to restrict around what they can do. What's now, the... we'll have that conversation about what that community can do. But that's just Di, a Di's perfect example of us already restricting what people can do in those high noise areas. So, uh, generally speaking, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of planning, I think this COVID period... Um, I, I, I think that government um, leaders should take stock and think about planning, uh, planning for infrastructure, planning for job growth in Western Sydney, Greater Western Sydney. For me, uh, it's very important. Uh, you know, that's where jobs growth is going to be. The population mm. is going to grow. Um, for, I, Fairfield City Council. Jobs just for me, don't happen unless you actually do something. Yeah, like well, absolutely, absolutely. Right absolutely. But then, but then, what about mm. um, my understanding? Is Jordan Spring, the the employment land mm. that's now being replaced by um, development high rise. So that's about five thousand jobs that's going to be lost, and that mm. I think that's in your area. So what are you going to do about that? Um, so I think it's very important that we look at. Uh, how manufacturing can, you know, the industry can grow because obviously we need to support that. Um, for me, South West, uh, West Fairfield City is the largest manufacturing em employers, uh, employers in, in, our, in our area. So what will government do to enable more industry to grow um, and support those industry to, you know, move back into manufacturing because it's important now okay. not to rely just on one, you know, manufacturer. And that's exactly China. why the developments around the Aerotropolis are absolutely critical. About yeah. only 8% of land in Sydney CBD is zoned for non-residential uses. It's so critical that we leverage the investment in that airport to create land that brings advanced manufacturing, that brings technology jobs, uh, that brings manufacturing that's been the heartbeat of places like Ingleburn and Fairfield and Weatherall Park, well, Smithfield. The Aerotropolis, in and I think, is one locations. of the best things that's ever happened. I think I've you know looked into it and I think it's fantastic, but that's never been the issue for me or even for the residents. It's like we need to know how we can make the most of this. Where are the jobs? You know, and they're they're there or they're coming as well as uh, free education as well, but the communication of that to the residents and to the people, that's lacking. Okay, let's take our next question. It's from Benjamin Kremen. 
Uh, hi, panel. Uh, before the question, I just want to say sorry for the loss of your mum, and you're doing an excellent, excellent job. Thank you. Uh, uh, men who abuse should be prosecuted and shamed, um, and you're doing a fantastic job. Uh, the support services that have ramped up in this pandemic, why was it smart business to increase uh, welfare payments rather than um, uh, allow people who are, whose hours went through the roof to have that extra overtime tax-free. Then they can spend that in failed business, businesses, extra available spending cash in their pocket. So you're referring to job keeper, job seeker? Uh, no, no, no. Job... Uh, seeker. Se yeah, welfare job. payments. Not okay. the ones for employers to keep jobs. Just why was it smart smarter business to increase a welfare payment rather than decrease the tax people pay with extra income earned over this period. Federal. Dile. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that's a federal government issue. Um, look, I think, I, I, I think that for me um, in South West Sydney, um, we need more investment in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in enterprise. Uh, to encourage people to come up with enterprise ideas and entrepreneurship is very important. Um, I think the job seeker, my understanding, was to help those that are currently on, on I think, um, unemployment to get to encourage them to go and seek a you know, job. Now, I don't know why the federal government make the decision for, because it was hoping to kickstart the economy, but, but from my perspective, a, bit, uh, a wiser spending would have been looking at the small businesses in our community because there are at the end of the day, 80%, they're the backbone of our society. And I believe that a lot of businesses, for instance, you know, a local business uh, who said to me, you know, why couldn't uh, we raise the thresholds threshold for GST collection, for instance, uh, for currently at $75,000, so that small businesses can actually don't have to pay to, you know, increase the, GST, um, the threshold to much higher. So those little minute details, that's the government tools, the government policy should look at how to make it easier for small business to run in this, you know, most difficult, challenging time that we, we can, face. Can I, just, I just want to bring yeah. in Georgia Meredith. I think you're in the audience. You, you are on JobSeeker, I oh, think. Right. I've been out of work since July and currently on JobSeeker. So when the coronavirus supplement was 550, that was livable. Now it's at 250 and I struggle. And when it's reduced again, I'll be on $408 a week, which is below the poverty line. Mm. I yeah. have two bachelor degrees and I ha am admitted as a solicitor in New South Wales. I've applied for over 40 jobs. One job had over 800 applicants. Do you think then uh, if a government came up with an initiative to actually help you create a business opportunity, for instance, would that also actually help you? Like from my perspective, giving people like you some kind of support to um, yeah. get you motivated to, or, or get you support to create your own business, I think that's the, the way of the future. We, you know, there's an opportunity to go out and set up yourself. I, I think that's where, um, you know, government should actually provide that kind of, um, you know, Amanda? support. Oh, look, I, I love the, the idea of that. Um, but I run Small Business Women Australia as well, and starting a small business is hell, right? So in the, during COVID, it's probably not the best idea. Uh, I would like to say, can you please contact me? I know a lot of lawyers, um, so I'd love to connect you to them and even just have a conversation about maybe interview skills or whatever it is, or a job, whatever. But when it comes to the job seeker, um, the thing, job seeker was there to, as like a net to catch people, right? So people were being laid off in droves and they had bills to pay and they panicked. I think the issue is that now they need to work out who really needs job seeker and who really doesn't. For example, there are a lot of youth that are living at home that I know for a fact through my small business community have quit their job to go on job seeker when there's a single mum over here panicking because they're going to reduce job seeker and she needs the money. So there needs to be um, you know scaled job seeker or just say right here's an opportunity to go into trades. We have such a shortage with trades. You know there are 800 jobs out there for plumbers, electricians, carpenters just in Western Sydney and small business have just been incentivised to take on trade. So looking at alternatives, 
But I understand what you're saying, but the reason why it was there was just a net, really to save people's livelihoods, but now it needs to be looked at to say, actually, there are jobs available, how can we, uh, and I know the government's funding some of this to actually get people job ready for a different type of career, look at a different option, but job seeker needs to still remain at a, at a rate that some people actually need to survive. Hmm. We can't just blanket have the same approach for everyone. All right. Well, that is all we've got time for tonight. Would you please thank our panel? Amani Hayda, Stuart Ayres, Di Lee, Richard Miles and Amanda Rose. Please put your hands together. Uh, you guys have been a fantastic audience tonight, so thanks so much for coming in and sharing your stories and your questions. Next week, it'll be our final Q&A of the year. And we're asking how 2020 has changed all of us. How's it changed you? We'd love you to share your story as well, so head to our website now and upload a short video. Help us reflect on this unforgettable year. A huge lineup next week, including Jimmy Barnes, who'll take us out with a live performance. I promise, do not miss it. Good night. <laughs>